All right, folks, uh, welcome to week six. Uh, we are certainly cruising along here. Uh, as a reminder, uh, last Friday was the due date for your classical arguments. So what we're actually going to be doing now is moving on to the next project that you guys are doing, uh, and that is the evaluation argument. So let's take a look at uh, what we are uh, talking about when we talk about an evaluation. So first thing to think about, what is actually is an evaluative argument? Well, at its simplest, uh, it's a review, giving an opinion on the quality of the subject based on criteria that you're going to create, okay? So however you determine what the quality is of your subject, uh, that's going to determine your argument, uh, how you determine that, okay? What criteria does it meet? What criteria does it not meet, okay? Now, evaluations have more in common with strong response essays than they do with traditional persuasion, and that typically they require minimal research. You have to be at least familiar with what's being evaluated before you can make an argument over whether it's quality or not. So just keep that in mind. Uh, you're going to be really reacting to something and presenting your argument as to why you think it is good or bad. Okay. The persuasive nature of an evaluation makes it different from a typical movie or restaurant review that simply note the good points and bad points of the thing being evaluated. Okay? It's not supposed to be more than just a bullet point check of what is what are good, some good things, what are some bad things. Okay, I would personally, though, argue that that's no longer the case, especially in the case of media reviews, because I almost always take a side. Okay, so uh, one thing I would recommend here when we start thinking about evaluative arguments, do not make it just a bullet point of this is what I like, this is what I don't like. Okay, you want to make it into something that's going to have a provable argument, something that's going to make the reader think, okay, you thought this through more than just I like this or I don't like this. Uh, you have good reasoning for it. There has to be logical reasoning behind why you choose to uh, degrade something as opposed to uh, enhance it, uh, endorsing it. All right, so to start off here, uh, I just want to give you a little bit of a warm-up exercise in dealing with uh, evaluation, okay? To get an idea about the kind of writing we're talking about, I want you to try some, okay? Uh, when I've done this class in the past, there was a textbook that was used uh, that when we got into evaluation, used the example of cell phones, uh, comparison cell phones. It was really dated, okay? Uh, so much so that uh, the phones that were uh, being evaluated. One was a BlackBerry, one was a flip phone, and uh, then you had a smartphone. Uh, what I'm going to have you do is a modified version of that activity uh, for the start of this week's uh, lecture activities. Okay? Uh, we're doing an updated version of it. So, what I want you to do is uh, for this uh, particular exercise, just really quick research some of the features on an iPhone and some of the features on an Android phone. Okay? This will especially help if you can use the uh, resources that you have in terms of any either of these phones that you actually own. Okay, if you own a, a, an iPhone or if you own an Android running smartphone. Okay, which phone do you prefer and why? Okay, you're going to be writing this on the discussion board, so make sure that it's going to be suitable for consumption. Okay, now. Uh, in addition to this, you're also going to be recommending which phone would be better for uh, these four individuals. Okay. Now, since I Apple is the only manufacturer of the iPhone, that makes it easy. Let's go with the latest edition of the iPhone, which I believe is the iPhone 12. Okay. Uh, assume for the purposes of the exercise that the Android phone, uh, as it's the... Uh, most popular selling model uh, and most advanced model, we're going to go with the most recent Samsung Galaxy model. Okay? <clears throat> now, for each of these people, I want you, based on your evaluation of the phones, to determine which of these phones would be better for each individual. Okay? So, the four individuals are a grandmother trying to keep in touch with her family. Okay? Now, keep Keep in mind, you want to evaluate, evaluate based on every aspect of this person's, of this individual's needs and that individual themselves, okay? So we're talking about grandmother here, okay? Somebody at least in their mid-60s, okay? We'll go with that. 
Second one, a freshman starting college. Uh, we're going to go with the stereotypical freshman that's going to be approximately 18, 19 years old. Okay? A single mother who needs to be in contact with her work consistently. Okay? Uh, so let's put this person's age at approximately maybe 29, 30, 31. Okay? Uh, and it's a single, a single mother, so she has at least one child. Uh, last one, a family of four looking for multiple phones to keep in touch at all times. Okay? Uh, so we're going to, family of four, we're going to assume it's a typical nuclear family, uh, mother, father, uh, two, two children, uh, one older than the other by maybe about two years. Both of them are in double digit ages. Okay? So, uh, go ahead and pause me for a bit and, uh, do this. First off, uh, compare the two phones and decide which phone you prefer, the iPhone or the Android. And then... Make the choice for those four individuals. Which phone is better for each one of those individual each one of those individual cases? Okay, uh, take about uh, twenty minutes on this. Go ahead and pause me and complete that exercise. And we're back. Hopefully you have uh, made a good enough uh, suggestion for those individuals that they'll be happy with their phone purchases. Okay? Now, <clears throat> what we're going to be doing here now is talking about how to approach the evaluation. Now, the main way that you want to approach this is a method called the criteria match process. Okay? So here's how it works. You're going to compose a series of criteria as to what determines quality in your mind. Then line up the evaluation subject against those criteria and determine whether it meets those criteria or not. Okay? So, in this case, what you're doing is you're making a list of what you expect out of something within that general category. Okay? Let's say, for instance, you are uh, evaluating airline. Okay? Evaluating airline based on one flight. So, uh, what do you expect from an airline? You expect comfort. You expect affordability. 
you expect surface, you expect on time. Okay, those are your four criteria for your evaluation. Now, if you are working with an airline that's really good about all four of these things, uh, and call me biased, but my favorite actually is Southwest, uh, then you're going to have a positive evaluation on them. Okay, uh, they're very very good value. Typically, very well, they're very good about being on time, uh, very comfortable, uh, and their service tends to be exceptional. Okay, <clears throat> now. Uh, an airline that does, falls short of that uh, may be one that you're not going to rate as well, okay? <clears throat> so, uh, the criteria that you choose is going to be the primary arbiter of good or bad in this process. Whatever meets what's good in your, in your opinion uh, is going to uh, lean toward the good under that criteria. So when you're coming up with the criteria, it's not just what you're going to be judging. It's going to be where it has to sit on your scale in order to meet the good criteria. Okay? Now, one thing also to keep in mind, the subject does not have to meet all criteria to be judged as good. Okay? So uh, you have, to go back to the airline example, you have a lot of luxury airlines out there uh, that have exceptional service. They have exceptional comfort. They're really good at being on time. The only thing that they strike out on typically is value because typically they are humongously expensive. Okay. Uh, if, you, if you see a lot of uh, YouTubers that do travel, uh, especially if you look at airlines that fly to the Middle East, uh, particularly Arab-owned airlines such as uh, Emirates, uh, you see guys that are travel bloggers that are flying first class on these airlines uh, and telling you that the amount of money they paid for that one ticket for round trip is usually in the neighborhood of five figures, ten, eleven, twelve thousand dollars just for the flight. Okay, but they're being treated like a king on that flight. So they're going to evaluate it as good even though it costs them an arm and a leg an arm and a leg and a firstborn child. Okay? <clears throat> so uh, again, determine your, what your criteria is going to be, what your categories are, where it has to land in that category in order to be considered good. And that's what you're going to compare against. The MET criteria then become the reasonings behind your evaluative argument. What, whatever good you pick out of that uh, subject, that's going to be how you're going to determine whether it's good or bad. It's going to result in your end argument. Okay? <clears throat> so... Uh, for example, here uh, we have the uh, uh, YouTube account. How it should have ended. They do reviews of movies from time to time. Okay. Now in 2017, they put out this review of uh, the movie Wonder Woman. Now I'm going to have you guys watch this, and uh, I want you to try to figure out what the reviewers' criteria are. All right, folks. So uh, here is the uh, review of uh, Wonder Woman. Uh, I want you to try to listen to his review and try to pick out the criteria he's using uh, to uh, determine the quality of this movie. Also keep in mind that uh, you have to keep in mind the uh, uh, point of view of the reviewer. Uh, in this case we have a guy who is a uh, pop culture fan, uh, does a lot of stuff with uh, superhero movies, uh, does a lot with the comics, is kind of familiar with the comics, so uh, let's take a listen and see if you can figure, point out, pick out his criteria. Hey everyone, how's it going? I just saw Wonder Woman and I got back and said, man, we got to do another review. What's this you say? Two reviews? So close together? That's not normal. What happened to you? Didn't you used to like make How It Should Have Ended videos? Yes, I've been making How It Should Have Ended videos for 12 years actually, and, I'm, and I haven't stopped now. But anyway, I'll update you on that stuff at the end, because it's ladies first, homie, and you're not here to listen to me talk about my stuff. You want to talk about Wonder Woman. So what do you say? Let's get to it. Wonder Woman! She's gonna punch the violence out of you Wonder Woman! And Captain Kirk is her new boo <clears throat> Alright, Wonder Woman 
The movie we were all looking forward to, but also expected to self-implode and burst into flames and squeal a depressing, embarrassing death because we had crossed our arms long ago with all this previous Wonder Woman silly business and started to lose faith in this character ever having her own movie is finally here. And guess what? It doesn't suck! It is awesome, actually. DC finally delivers the Wonder Woman you've been hoping for. Directed by Patty Jenkins and written by these three dudes. Huh. It is so good, you guys. It hits so many important beats. If you wanted a timeless origin story, you got it. If you wanted something that makes you excited for Wonder Woman in the Justice League, you got it. If you wanted a strong female role model for the world to look up to, you got it. If you wanted awesome sweet action sequences, you got it. If you wanted a movie that has a great message, you got it! I'm getting really excited, sorry. This is almost a perfect superhero film, and I hesitate saying the word almost. Only because, even though I really appreciated everything that was said and done in this film, there are some things at the end that I would just want a little bit more. But coming from a guy that makes How It Should Have Been videos for a living, I doubt that comes as much of a surprise. So my short review is, guess what? Go check it out. Wonder Woman is classic and beautiful and awesome. Gal Gadot, Gadot? Is that how you say it, right? Gal Gadot? That's what I said. She completely has my vote. And honestly, I didn't think I would like her when she was first cast. I thought, yeah, I mean, she's hot and she kind of looks like Wonder Woman, but she's so skinny! I mean, shouldn't Wonder Woman, like, have muscle tone? Like an Amazon? And Gal Gadot shows up in this movie and she's like, sit down, you don't know me! Kapow! Does all this cool fight choreography and straight up puts me in my place. She's awesome. Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman has arrived and she has raised the bar that the rest of the Justice League will have to live up to, in my opinion. Because in all honesty, Wonder Woman is good enough that it doesn't need the Justice League tie-in. The tie-in is there, but there isn't an overly obvious handoff to the Justice League, and I really like that. There isn't an after credit scene, Warner Brothers is like, Stop expecting this from us! She don't need no stinking after credit scene! So my quick review is, I enjoyed it, go check it out. If you want to talk more details, then let's talk spoilers. Spoiler warning! Spoiler warning! I can't believe Chris Pine becomes Green Lantern at the end. How awesome was that? I'm kidding, that doesn't happen. Sorry. Wonder Woman becomes Green Lantern. I'm kidding. She dies. No, I'm just, that's, okay, whatever. Spoilers ahead, people. What did you think of the backstory? I enjoyed it, duh. Little Diana is growing up on Themyscira, all cute with a desire to punch things. She's surrounded by all these strong female warriors. Her mother's like, no, Diana, you will not be a fighter. It's too dangerous. And then immediately whispers into her sister's ear, train her harder than anyone has ever been trained before, ever. And her sister's like, oh yeah, this is Spartak. Blow! I thought that was cool. And it really sets up who Diana is and where she comes from very well. What do you think about Chris Pine? I thought he was a good choice for Steve Trevor. I thought him speaking in a German accent was kind of weird, uh, but he has a lot of funny parts. I love how they portrayed the lasso of truth being painful to resist. He's Diana's tour guide to the outside world in a way, so they share a lot of funny bits. But on the non-comical side, I thought they developed the relationship with him and Diana pretty well. Their relationship moves kind of fast, but most movie relationships do. What do you think about the supporting cast? There are a lot of sidekick characters in this movie. They often act only as comic relief, like Steve Trevor's secretary, but there's also his team of war misfits. Is that the proper description? War misfits? That's what they feel like. They all have struggles and have accepted their current way of life, but Diana sort of gives each one of them a sense of purpose, which is pretty cool. Wonder Woman encourages everyone she talks to, even the ice cream guy. You should be so proud. I like that joke a lot. What did you think about the villains? So there's like two evils at play in this movie, which made it interesting. The evil of humanity that Steve Trevor is fighting is represented by the Germans with Dr. Poison and Ludendorff, while Wonder Woman is looking to defeat an even bigger evil, the god of war, Ares. She believes wholeheartedly that she can end all war by killing him, and this adds a really interesting dynamic when she has to face the idea that all mankind is ultimately flawed. Of the three big villains, I'd say that Ares was the most disappointing, and I'd even question if the casting of that role was the right choice. While David Thulis does Sinister pretty well, he doesn't really come off as godlike to me. 
and it was really tough to buy him in the role of Ares once the final battle got underway. Even with all the fake armor and muscles, to me he was far more effective as the ghost-like figure that Diana couldn't reach through the window. But he transforms into this Lord of the Rings looking armor and it turns into the usual who can hit each other the hardest fight sequence. Uh, in a lot of ways, the climactic battle scene uh, was the least impressive part to me. But it had its merits. Wonder Woman had to come to terms with the idea that humans might not always deserve to be saved, which was driven home when she stared down Dr. Poison at her most vulnerable. Maybe we don't deserve to be saved, but Wonder Woman believes that we should be saved. One of the scenes from the climax I found most interesting was Steve's goodbye moment with Diana where you can't hear what's being said. He gets on the plane and sacrifices himself to stop the gas from reaching its target, but that's not the interesting part. What's interesting is, we don't know the words that were actually said because the sound is dampened from the explosion blast. Then, when Diana is fighting Ares, she thinks of the goodbye a second time. Only this time, we actually hear the words they are saying. And the words are her screaming, I can do it! Whatever it is, I can do it! And he says, no, I can save today. You can save the world. I love you. You are meant to think this is what actually was said in that scene. But I think, really, she never heard the real words. And the dialogue we hear is what she believes was said. Diana says a couple times in the movie, what matters is what you believe. And she believes that love is the answer. And that's what gives her the strength to fight on. And I kind of think that's the point. Honestly, more than anything, this movie works so well because they really got the character of Wonder Woman so right. She's the perfect amount of good and passion and power that we've always wanted to see. So even with a cheesy line here and there, Wonder Woman completely sells the rest of this movie. And her moral compass is exactly what we want to see in ourselves and in every human. So seeing someone with such strength and conviction is inspiring. And that was the point. Steve tells her in the film, you can do nothing or something. And I've already tried nothing. There are several scenes in this film where often people are choosing to do nothing when the world is at war and in despair. I don't think Diana has ever tried nothing. She was created with the desire to do something from the very beginning. Even when she was a little girl, she was determined. And that speaks to an audience that has witnessed a lot of hurt in the real world right now. We desperately want a hero that wants to do something about it and will lead the charge. She isn't reluctant, she's unwavering. She points out what is broken and immediately goes to fix it. I think this movie works so well because deep down, we all want Wonder Woman to be real. And isn't that what a superhero movie is supposed to be all about? All right, so you've seen what his review was. Uh, so now the challenge for you, uh, take a, uh, if you need to, you can uh, watch the video again. Uh, it is linked in the slideshow, as you can see here. Uh, try to pick out what his criteria were. Uh, what was he rating, what kind of categories was he rating the movie against, okay? Uh, what kind of thing, what were his standards of quality is basically what we're getting to, okay? So we'll take uh, about 10 minutes to do that. Uh, go ahead and pause me, and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, do that. We'll come back. We'll come back in a bit.
Okay, we are back. Now, let's talk briefly about the issues that they could revise regarding criteria. Okay? Uh, one, of the, one of the big things that you have to consider when you're thinking about your criteria is the purpose and context of your review, of your ev evaluation. Okay? It's important to keep in mind the context of the subject being evaluated, as well as the context and background of the evaluator. The writer's inherent biases and or background will influence the criteria used. For example, as I mentioned before in that video, the How I Should Have Ended review of Wonder Woman is from the perspective of a superhero fan, implying that he is at very least familiar with the comic book source material. Okay, he actually makes mention of this in the video. Okay, so keep in mind, uh, your exposure to it and your closeness to the subject matter is going to influence uh, your inherent biases about that subject matter. And that may lead you to rate something a little bit more positively than it deserves. Okay? Just keep that in mind. There are some special problems that come up when you deal with evaluations. Alright, one of them is dealing with different classes. Okay? Subjects should be compared only to other members of their class or category. In other words, do not compare apples to oranges. Okay, if you are comparing uh, hotels, do not compare something like uh, the uh, Ritz Carlton to a Motel Six. Okay, because there's going to be no comparison between those two. If you are comparing films, make sure that they're within the same genre. Okay, uh, Wonder a Wonder Woman review by itself is all right. Okay, that's perfectly okay. But do not try to compare that to something that is so, so far outside of its realm uh, that it can't even be compared to it. Like, for instance, if you were to compare it to, like, uh, uh, any Jane, uh, Jane Eyre, okay? You cannot compare those two. There's universes of differences between them. So any comparison is going to be invalid. Uh, you have competing standards, perfection versus reality. This is a this is a hard one for people to deal with. Okay, be upfront in regards to whether the criteria being used for evaluation is ideal or achievable. Okay, some people know exactly what they want. Okay, and some people's standards are so high that absolutely nothing can reach that goal. Okay. Uh, I'm sure they figure figure that if they wrote it themselves, they might be able to reach that goal, but you have to be reasonable in terms of how much your subject meets the criteria. If it meets it to an acceptable level, if it reaches an achievable goal, then it's more likely to have a more positive impact. It's going to be more legit. Okay, it's going to be uh, it's going to have a little bit more credibility than a, a review where you're setting the standards impossibly high. You have seductive empirical methods, rationalizing everything into numbers, okay? This is a hard one to avoid as well. Good evaluations take the non-quantifiable into account in addition to anything that can be quantified, okay? So people have a tendency to do this all the time. And it's not just students, it's academics that do this as well. Especially if you look at older, at older academic works, they have a tendency to do this all the time. Okay, a prime example of this actually comes from a film. Uh, you're familiar with a film called Dead Poets Society. Uh, it was uh, one of the better Robin Williams films. Uh, it involved him become, as a uh, school teacher in the 60s. He's teaching at a uh, uh, elite boys' private school. Okay, a private high school. Uh, he's an English teacher, and he has a textbook that he has to use. It's a poetry. It's a poetry collection. It has a foreword by an esteemed uh, uh, doctor of English, okay? Uh, someone who's a college professor. Uh, he's, the introduction of the book is basically telling the students what the, they need to do to determine the quality of a piece of literature is set up a chart, okay? Set up a chart, okay? where the x-axis is the complexity of the language and the y-axis is the vividness of the imagery. Okay? You're basically trying to quantify something that is not quantifiable into numbers. Okay? Uh, to which Robin Williams' teacher character uh, interrupts the student reading the, the, the foreword uh, and tells him, crap, crap, it's all crap. 
okay? Uh, and proceeds to tell the students to rip out the first 25 pages of the book because they're all that guy's introduction. Do not let yourself get influenced by, uh, let's try to give something a score, okay? Because not everybody's score is going to be alike. Not everybody's going to be running on the same scale as you are, okay? So your 10 might be somebody else's 3. So don't try to convert everything into numbers. That's what basically we're getting to. Another one that uh, is easy to fall into is tyranny of cost. Okay? Is something automatically better because it's more expensive? Spoiler, no, it's not. Okay? Uh, there are several Hollywood block would-be blockbusters that f failed miserably that can attest to this. Just because you spend, you sink a lot of money into something does not necessarily mean it's going to be good. Okay? Uh, you could just be putting it into a giant money pit. All right, so do not let that influence whether you think something is quality or not. Just because something's more expensive doesn't mean it's better. Okay. There's also three types of criteria that wind up arising when you think about a uh, evaluation. We have three types of criteria: it's necessary, sufficient, and accidental. Okay. Now, what's the difference between the three you're asking? Okay, first off, sufficient criteria. This is baseline nominal criteria. It's the least that you need to get by. Okay, uh, it's basically what you need in order for it to qualify as something of that category. Okay, at the very basic, to qualify as a story, it needs to have a beginning, a middle, a climax, and an end. Okay, that's the minimum. But you want to go above and beyond that. Okay. That's where we get into necessary criteria, which is what you feel is acceptable. Now, keep in mind that necessary criteria is not necessarily the same as sufficient criteria. Okay? For example, a job which gives you a lot of time for your family but pays nearly nothing can be described as necessary but not sufficient. Not all criteria are met. Okay? Yeah, it's a job. Yeah, you get time with your family. But if you're being paid slavery wages, it's not going to do you any good. Okay, so do not think that necessary is the same as sufficient. It's not. Sufficient is the baseline. Necessary is what you need to be, uh, I don't want to say comfortable, but yeah, comfortable. Okay, that's the best description. Uh, the third one is accidental. Okay, accidental crit criteria are added bonuses which are neither necessary or sufficient, but they're nice to have. They are not required, but are an added benefit. Okay. Uh, sometimes these arise when you are evaluating uh, something because maybe you didn't expect to have that and it's something that you actually like a lot. So you wind up accepting it as, okay, this is something that uh, works to help this be higher quality. Okay? So keep in mind that all three criteria, all three types of criteria are important for doing an evaluation. However, Again, just remember, sufficient is your baseline. Necessary is what makes it quality. So let's talk about developing an evaluation argument. The development of arguments for evaluation, again, very similar to that for classical arguments. Every claim needs to have a reasoning behind it and evidence to support that reasoning. Okay? Now, going one step further than that, though, in evaluation arguments, there's also an underlying criterion, which is the basis for that claim and reasoning and should also additionally be supported by other evidence and arguments, okay? Now, here's one thing to keep in mind here, okay? The evidence that you're going to present for your evaluation argument is all going to be, should all be present in whatever it is you're evaluating, okay? There's not really a lot of call for an extensive amount of research when you're doing evaluation. The research is you're experiencing whatever it is you're evaluating, okay? So, uh, draw from that, and against your criteria, pull the, pull the evidence that shows why uh, it does or does not meet that criteria, that necessary criteria that you've set up. Okay? So, uh, that gets us into the next exercise here. Okay? Uh, so, this is going to be the third exercise for this video. Uh, I want you to evaluate an argument I'm going to show you. This is going to be a counter-argument to the How It Should Have Ended Wonder Woman review. 
Okay. Uh, this is this is what I want you to look for. First off, the claim, and the reason for that claim. Okay. So, what is the main thing that this uh, uh, evaluator is arguing for? Second, what evidence does he have to support the reason? Okay. Third, underlying assumption criterion based on what's presented. Okay. So, where is what is the criteria that he is that he's using to compare this? Okay. And what kind of assumption is he making about it? Okay. Uh, and then fourth is going to be the evidence uh, or the arguments to support the assumption or criterion. Okay. So we'll go ahead and have you take a look at this, okay? I'm only going to give you highlights of it here because A, it's extremely long, and B, this guy is very drunk and very Scottish, okay? Uh, and as such, he has ex is extremely loose with his language. So I don't want to uh, leave a profanity peppered uh, class video on YouTube. So what I'll do is I'll give you some highlights of this video. If you want to see the whole thing, you're going to need to click through on the slides. Okay? All right, so here we go. This is a video from a uh, another movie reviewer by the name who has a uh, YouTube channel by the name of Critical Drinker. Okay? Here we go. You know, a thought occurred to me when I woke up in my bathtub this morning. I've said before that Marvel might be running out of creative energy after the big blowout of Avengers Endgame, and it makes me wonder if audience interest will start to wane now that most of their favourite characters have been replaced with something... else. But the irony is that just as the MCU might be heading into troubled waters, the DC movies finally seem to be getting their act together. Aquaman was a surprise hit that grossed over a billion dollars worldwide, while Shazam proved to be a winner with critics and audiences. The point is, DC seems to be in a much better place now than it was a few years ago, and a lot of this change in fortune can be put down to the success of Wonder Woman. Most people probably didn't expect much from Wonder Woman when it was first announced. Least of all me. It was another movie in a failing franchise, directed by someone I'd never heard of, starring someone I didn't particularly care about, set during a conflict that most audiences probably know nothing about, and dealing with a character I knew best from the shitty 1970s TV show. Sorry, Linda. On paper, Wonder Woman seemed to have everything going against it, but everyone likes an underdog and we were all pleasantly surprised when the movie hit theatres and turned out not to be a complete disaster. In fact, it went on to gross over $800 million worldwide, established Gal Gadot as a leading lady, and helped to resurrect a film universe that seemed to be on its last legs. Well, until Justice League dropped on us like a $300 million turd. Everyone was loving Wonder Woman, and they just couldn't say enough good things about it. But that was then, and this is now, and since the dust has settled, it seems like a good time for me to look back on Wonder Woman and assess it through lenses unclouded by expectations and excitement. Beer goggles and cataracts will have to do. Before I really get into my criticism, I will say there are a lot of things this movie gets right. The casting of Gal Gadot was a brilliant choice. She's beautiful and natural in the role. She seemed to capture Diana's sense of wonder, innocence and optimism. And she actually <coughs> seems like a genuinely good and humble person that you can't help but warm to. Unlike someone I could name. Patty Jenkins really seems to understand her limitations as an actress and she works around them pretty effectively, allowing her more experienced co-stars to do most of the heavy lifting. And there's a decent chemistry between her and Pine, although for some reason he's picked up a stutter in this movie that really boils my piss after a while. What are they doing? I don't know! I don't know. I, I, Aries I know is dead. You, I, because I mean, that's because may, uh, maybe it's them. I, I, Aries I is dead. Can, I, Jesus Christ, man, just spit it out. Anyway, it makes me laugh that they gave everyone on Thermoskira an Israeli accent, rather than try to make Gal Gadot speak like an American. Diana at least has a good character arc. She goes from a naive and sheltered young woman who sees only the best in humanity, to a wiser but ultimately sadder character who's experienced the worst aspects of mankind. But ultimately she regains her faith that there's something noble in the human spirit that's worth fighting for. Most of the action scenes are well shot and there's enough downtime and character moments in between to pace things out. The dialogue is passable, there are some decent jokes even if it lacks the slick wittiness of the Marvel movies, but at least it's not as dull and pretentious as the Zack Snyder films. 
There are problems with Wonder Woman, though, and most of them revolve around the script. The villain's motivations are muddled and confused, constantly trying to bend themselves around whatever's actually happening in the story, and usually they end up contradicting themselves and undermining the film's message. Ludendorff and Dr. Poison are pretty dull as secondary antagonists, which is a shame because they're played by good actors who could do a lot more if they had better material to work with. The village people wannabes also had the potential to be good, but aside from Samir, they never really do anything useful. The Scottish guy is the absolute worst example. He's got PTSD and he can't bring himself to shoot anyone, so you might think his plot arc would be about learning to overcome his fear and fight to save his friends at a crucial moment. But you'd be wrong, he's just as much of a useless arsehole by the end as he was at the start. What's a waste of time? The final battle seemed like it was going to do something interesting until it disintegrated into a mindless, overblown, ridiculous CGI mess where I couldn't even tell what was going on half the time. I also couldn't tell you how Diana actually defeated Ares in the end. It's not like she found some hidden flaw in an otherwise unstoppable enemy and used it to turn the tables on him. She just kinda blasted him and then he was gone. Wonder Woman clearly wants to say something about the conflicted nature of humanity, our destructive impulses versus our capacity for bravery and sacrifice. It just doesn't know exactly what it wants to say or how to get it across. What you're left with instead is a superficially charming film with good intentions that knows how to pull all the right emotional strings but ultimately misses the mark because its script just isn't smart enough to deal with the weighty philosophical themes it tries to address. Honestly, I think most of us were so amazed that it wasn't a steaming pile of garbage that we were willing to overlook its flaws and just enjoy it for what it was. The problem is that what it was got consistently blown out of proportion in our collective minds until the film ultimately took on a reputation that it didn't quite deserve. Did I hate it? Not at all. In fact, I like it a lot more than most movies of its kind. But it's my job to drink and to criticise as honestly as possible. And now that I've done one, it's time to get cracking on the other. Oh, and that's all I have for today. Go away now. Alright, so now that you've heard Critical Drinker's uh, review, uh, this is what I, again, want you to uh, uh, do this exercise uh post it to the discussion board. Uh, what you're looking for from his review is the claim that he makes and the reason for that claim, the evidence to support that reason, uh, the underlying assumption or criteria based on what's presented, okay? Uh, what, what kind of assumptions is he making based on what he's talking about? And then evidence or arguments to support the assumption or criteria, okay? Uh, we'll give you about 10 minutes to do this and uh, we'll be back.
All right, we are back. So, uh, one other thing I want to do this week as far as activity goes to try to help you understand what we're talking about in terms of evaluation, what's going to be expected of you for this assignment. Uh, we're going to look at some sample writing. So what I have is, for you is a sample evaluative essay uh, written, named, written by a student named Jackie Wingard. Okay, uh, This is an actual student essay. She's evaluating a museum called the Experience Music Project in Seattle, Washington, also known as the EMP. Okay? So, uh, what I want you to do is take a look at the essay, read it critically, and answer some questions. Now, if you're wondering where you find this essay, uh, it is going to be on eCampus. It's directly underneath the slides for this, uh, for this week. Uh, it is labeled Week Six Writing Example EMP. Okay, that will take you. That will take you to a Word document. Specifically, it takes you to this Word document. Okay, uh, title of her work is EMP Music History or Music Trivia. Okay. Now I want you to read through this, and there's a few questions I want you to answer. So the first question: How did Jackie Wingard compare the EMP facility to the criteria she presents? Okay, so try to figure out what her criteria is for the evaluation and try to determine how she's uh, evaluating the EMP facility against that. Okay, second thing, pick out the reasons why the EMP does or does not meet a criteria according to Wingard. Okay, so what are the reasons she's giving that it does or does not meet some of her criteria? Uh, the third one here is going to take a little bit of legwork for you guys. So I want you to do some online research on EMP. Okay, Without any in-person experience with the EMP, would you agree with Wingard's evaluation and why or why not? Okay. Now, to make this easy on you when you do a Google search for the EMP, uh, you have to look for EMP being part of the Seattle Music Museum of Pop Culture. Okay. Uh, otherwise, you just type in EMP on Google, and you're probably going to get a lot of stuff talk about electromagnetic pulses. Okay, uh, what we're looking for here is the Experience Music Project. Okay, so uh, I am actually going to set up a separate response uh, thread for uh, your your uh, response to the EMP article. Okay, uh, but I'll give you about 20 minutes to read through the read through the essay and give your answer to these questions, uh, and we'll be back.
right, and we're back. All right, so uh, here is the actual assignment for you guys to do the evaluative argument, okay? And this is going to be an assignment where your workshop sessions are actually going to wind up straddling spring break, okay? Evaluative argument essay is going to be due on March 26th at midnight, okay? Uh, there are going to be two workshop weeks, okay? First one is the week of March 12th, uh, which is the revision, okay? Okay, uh, I think I've got that right. Do I have that right? Let me double check my calendar. Okay. Excuse me, that should be the week of March 8th, okay? Uh, my bad on that. Uh, there will be two workshops on this. First one is the week of March 8th, which is your revision workshop. Uh, the following week is spring break. There will be nothing going on that week, obviously. Uh, the, the week after that, the week of March 22nd, is the proofreading and editing workshop. That's also the week that it's due. Okay? That's going to work the same way as last week did. Uh, the link to turn it in is not going to go live until the Thursday of that week. Okay? Uh, you'll be writing an evaluation of a particular subject. There are no requirements in terms of what you evaluate but it has to be something you have a good familiarity with. For instance, if you choose to evaluate a film, you should have watched the film at least twice to give a fair evaluation. Okay? So there's no limits on what you can evaluate. Uh, I'm not going to limit you. It has to be some, a certain thing. Okay? What I am going to ask, though, is, something that, is that it has to be something that you have uh, intimate uh, knowledge of. Okay? Something you yourself have experienced. Okay? And it can be anything. It can be a movie. It can be a book. It can be a TV show. It can be a theme park. It could be anything else. Okay? Whatever you feel like giving evaluation to. That is what I want you to use as your subject matter. Now, as part of this assignment, you should have a clear set of criteria for your evaluation. You need to come up with your list of what does it need to have and how much of each item it does it have to have in order to be a good, of good quality. Okay? I will be asking that you include a list of your criteria along with your drafts when you turn the assignment in. Okay, so uh, in the place where you would normally put a work cited uh, in your uh, file, that's where I want your criteria. Okay, you might be asking, what about the work cited? Well, here's the reason why I said that. Uh, the base essay requirements for this it should be three to five pages again, double space. Should be 11 to 12 point font. Times New Roman area Calibri is the acceptable fonts. Uh, the works cited page is not required for this essay because your evaluation should only have a single research source, that being the evaluation subject. Okay? So in place of the works cited, I want the criteria list. Okay? What is the list of criteria and how good does something have to be in order to meet that criteria? If you do further research, though, you will need a works cited page. Okay, but there, but for the most part, for this essay, you should not need to do extended research. All you should need to do is have experience with the subject matter. <clears throat> okay, the evaluation should be organized so that your criteria for evaluation can be determined from the context of your writing. I'm actually going to be comparing the two to make sure that you have clearly stated this criteria is there. Okay. If I can't find a criteria f on your list in the essay, that's going to uh, cause your grade to suffer. If you include a criteria in your essay that you didn't include on your list, that's also going to make your grade suffer. Okay, so make sure they both line up. Okay. Now again, this is going to be due on March 26th. Uh, it's going to be due the first the first Friday after spring break. Okay, so you will have. An extra week to uh, work on it if you have the time. Okay? <clears throat> and that will do it for this uh, session. Uh, so, the urgent stuff going on this week, uh, you want to be working on MindTap. Uh, you want to be working on the discussion boards. You want to complete the exercises that I've given you in this, vi in this video lecture. Uh, I, also, I also want you to start considering what you want to evaluate. Okay? Uh, what kind of stuff do you want to give an evaluation of? What kind of topics are you thinking about? Okay, uh, and just start doing a little pre-writing. Try to determine what your criteria are going to be. Okay, uh, and 
we will continue talking about that about the valuations next week. So, uh, with that in mind, uh, I will see everybody then. Thanks for watching. <laughs>